Okay, well, I think everyone is muted. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. My name is Deanna DeCarvalho. I am the Regional Marketing Manager at Marine Max of the Hall Marine District. Um, thank you all so much for joining and attending our first ever um, virtual Women on Water class. Um, typically, we like to do these in a classroom setting uh, at the marina, on the water, actually on a boat. Um, but since we, current circumstances and um, as practicing social distancing, uh, we're working our best to um, still be able to deliver educational courses to you guys. Um, so this is our first time doing this, so bear with us and you know any technical difficulties, but it's gonna be really fun. Um, we will be putting on more of these classes. Um, for the time being, you can go to our Marine Max events page or you can like our Facebook page and I update all of our events on there. Um, and then any feedback that you guys have from the class today, um, please send to me so that we can uh, see how we can improve these classes in the future. And then also make sure you let all of your friends and families or any other ladies that are in boating um, know that we offer this class for free. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit talking about Marine Max and then I'm going to introduce Captain Graham who is going to be doing our class. Um, during the class, if you guys have a question, I encourage you to type them in in the chat section and I will be monitoring those so that way um, I can ask Captain Graham during uh, the class if you have any questions. We'll also be doing a questions portion at the end of the class. Um, so save any questions that you have for the end as well. Uh, we do have a lot of people on the class today. So um, if we don't get to your questions, uh, I promise you that we will email back to you or get your questions answered. Um, we are recording today's class. So I will also make sure to send all of you the PowerPoint that we use today um, along with the class. So, just to tell you guys a little bit about Marine Max, I know that um, people aren't very familiar with Marine Max here in the Charleston area. Um, we used to be Hall Marine and Marine Max acquired um, Hall Marine about two years ago. And we are the largest boat and yacht dealer in the country. Um, but we're really more than just a boat dealer. When you purchase a boat from us, um, you get the guidance of our sales professional experts to guide you through the boat buying process. Um, you also get our business manager who helps you with the finance process. And then we have an amazing service team um, who helps helps you maintain and keep your boat service um, to keep you out on the water, which is where we all wanna be. Um, and then we plan really awesome, fun getaways and events for our customers. We do our annual Kiowa Island Day Away every year where we just have all of our customers load up on their boats um, and just do a really fun cookout. And then we put on really great educational courses like this Women on Water class. Um, and then I think one of the most uh, favorite parts of what our customer loves about being a Marine Max customer is our captain delivery. So um, with every boat delivery on the day that you get to take your boat home, um, we have Captain Graham help you, guide you through, you know, learning your new boat and whatever questions you have, he's there as a resource. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Captain Graham. He's going to take over the class. Um, and again, I'll be watching the questions portion. So any questions that you ladies have, please don't hesitate to ask. Hello, everyone. Captain Graham. Uh, it's great to be here with you all today. Uh, yeah, this is our first virtual presentation and uh, Boating Basics 101. Basically, we're going to go over a, a bunch of different topics today. And believe me, there's no such thing as a dumb question. So if there is a, a pertinent question about one of the subjects that we're on, uh, Deanna would love to take that question and relay that to me. And I can uh, either either I can answer it now or we can do some further research and get back to you via email. But without further ado, um, welcome again and let's get started. Uh, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I've been working with Marine Max since last summer. I love it. I am the uh, in-house boat delivery captain. I'm also a technician and a rigger. Um, pretty well-rounded in um, all of the boating aspects here except sales. So uh, in the service department, we do um, a lot of service on boats that we have just received from manufacturers. We get them ready for sale. And also I fix boats that happen to have uh, broken down or had some issues 
along the way. So uh, my past experience in voting, I started off as a teen in the U.S. Coast Guard. I served two tours um, in Hawaii, California, and New York. I was a uh, federal law enforcement officer, search and rescue coordinator, uh, emergency medical technician. Uh, I was in precision navigation and a whole bunch of other hats that you could wear. Uh, yeah. I got out of the Coast Guard after about seven years, moved to Boston where I operated ferries, dinner cruises. I uh, operated ones about, you know, triple deckers, 400, person, uh, 400 passenger, and do cruises around the harbor uh, for private events and the commuter line. When I moved to Charleston about seven and a half years ago, I started immediately with Cobo US, becoming the uh, manager of operations there and the lead boat captain. After a few years, I wanted to try something new, and now uh, here I am. Anyway, why don't we go to the next slide and we'll start the presentation. We'll start off with a little bit of boat nomenclature or terminology. You know, if you want your salty points, it's good to know the official names of a boat, and we'll just start off with some basics. Of course, uh, forward is the same thing as forward, but if you're walking to the rear of the boat, you're walking aft. All right. The pointy thing on the boat, that's the bow. And the rear of the boat is called the stern. But if you're walking towards the stern, you're walking aft. Uh, we have the left side and the right side, but a salty mariner would never call it that. We call it port, starboard, left, right. What's the um, amount of water, or I'm sorry, the amount of boat that you have below the water, the amount of hull is called your draft. So if someone asks you, what's the draft of your vessel? We're talking about how deep does it sit from the water line. This also has a lot to do with if you're going to know if you're going to be traversing through some shallow areas, you need to know your draft, uh, especially when it is low tide. We have marker 117 Alpha in the ICW, the Intracoastal Waterway. That seems to be like flypaper for all of the sailboaters that have large or deep draft vessels. So I've been told that we can't see our PowerPoint. Oh, okay. PowerPoint. If we could fix that real quick. Um, I'll just keep it going now. Um, so yes, we have the water line here, and this is our draft below the water line, the deepest point of our boat. Uh, the deepest point of your boat is also called the keel. But once you get back above the water line, this is called your freeboard. And uh, let's let, let me know when we can see the slides again. So okay. Now the most asked or the farthest rear part of your boat, the most apt part is called your transom. The transom is what normally, if you have a, a motor vessel, your engines are connected. <clears throat> um, one more thing that we can go over that's still on this slide, if, if we can't see it, I'm gonna go ahead and explain it. Um, the width of your vessel, it's also known as a beam. So if you have an 8-6 beam, that's how wide your vessel is. If you're walking from, say this is my bow, from walking from starboard to port, I'm walking a thwart shift from beam to beam. Do we have any questions so far? Nope. I have, everyone's just making sure that we can see the slideshow. Okay. So we're going to move on. The, um, if you see something off your off your boat, you want to describe it to someone else who's on your boat or someone on the radio. We're going to talk, talk about if something is off your bow. We're going to go around like a clock, counter counterclockwise. So we have bow, port, stern, starboard, bow. But in between those, we go bow, port bow, 
14, fourth quarter, burn. Starboard quarter, starboard beam, starboard bow, bow. Have we got them? Yep, we're okay. good. Great. So we're getting our presentation back up. Hopefully everyone can see it again. That might have been hard to follow without the without the slide. Maybe if we go back one more time. We're gonna send everybody. Okay. So well, we'll we do have the opportunity to rewatch portion of it. We're going to go over knots later. You may want to uh, watch me do it, and then you can rewind it, fast forward, and uh, catch any portion that you missed or dozed off during. Hopefully not. Um, here's another good advice for all boaters. Uh, uh, three points of contact is always uh, recommended. Um, when I was in the Coast Guard, I would always get scolded at when I was a, uh, a newbie. And uh, my chief would always catch me walking around the boat. As if I had the best best balance in the world, and all of a sudden, once in a while, we take a nasty little wave, get knocked into the bulkhead or the wall of the boat, and um, it doesn't do too well when you're carrying coffee either for the morning. But uh, they always said, uh, one hand for yourself and one hand for the boat. Uh, we're talking about also having two points of good contact with your feet, and you're holding onto a rail or a banister or some kind of uh, sturdy object. Uh, most of the the injuries that happen on boats are ones where someone was operating and they either slam down the throttle or they take it back too quickly and they don't give any warning to their passengers on the bus. Uh, everyone knows there's no brakes on a boat, but if you take off the throttle quickly, the, uh, the boat is going to slow down very quickly and surge. And if you're not holding on to something, it's very easy uh, to get thrown down to the deck. So again, good advice for someone who's operating. For you ladies, maybe uh, that are new to boating, uh, if you're going to be operating that boat with other people on board, please let everyone know if you're going to be accelerating or decelerating or turning before you actually do it. And that gives everyone a chance to grab on you know, and take it, uh, take anyone off the car. Um, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Alcohol and boating. This seems to be a popular topic in Charleston, especially. <laughs> we um, we all see people drinking and boating, and I think a lot of people are unsure as to whether it's allowed or not, or to what degree. Well, it's just like uh, driving a car on the road. Alcohol is uh, allowed, but 0.08 or greater. That's the same uh, blood alcohol content as driving on a highway. Although the only difference is when you're boating, you are actually allowed to carry beer and operate the boat at the same time. It's just uh, you have to know when to stop. I used to be in law enforcement with the Coast Guard, and I have given many, many, many PUIs for boating under the influence uh, violations. What would happen is somebody would be boating, and we would just be kind of coming up to them to do a standard uh, law enforcement. We check the life jackets, we check registration. Uh, we don't need an apparent reason to pull anyone over, so it's not like, oh no, you were swerving. That's why we, no, it's not like that. Coast Guard does not need a reason. We have um, not just Coast Guard, but DNR, Department of Natural Resources, uh, local city police. Uh, we also have, uh, well, we've got many different Coast Guard units and the sheriffs are out there. So they're all able to pull over a boat without warning, without reason at any point. If you do low point or 08 or greater, and it, it, go back real quick. And if it was deemed to uh, <clears throat> be uh, 0.08 or greater, I'm sorry, if it was, uh, if you're deemed to be uh, operating under the influence, your boat could be seized or sold at an auction. Uh, they could affect your driving record. You could uh, possibly get your license suspended. We're talking about your car license, your vehicle on the road license. You know, it's not a car. It does um, tend sometimes. So the judge can actually affect that, depending on the situation. Uh, personally, in the Coast Guard, in my, in my uh, the days of the past, we usually just brought them in handcuffs to the dock and uh, 
we turned them over to local police. And from that point, that was their problem. And it's always recommended, in fact, it's necessary to have a fire extinguishers on board. Anything with a motor is going to require you to have some sort of fire extinguisher. Oh, well, here's an example of one. Uh, one thing you always want to check is the little gauge here. We have a red and green area. You want that little green slice of pie. It says charged. Some say overcharged or undercharged. That's just not going to cut it. You don't know if you can trust it to work the way you want it to. Uh, every uh, month or so, it's actually good to turn these dry chemical fire extinguishers upside down. Give it a couple pops from the bottom so that chemical can uh, sit and get crusted in the bottom over time. Um, the Coast Guard does recommend or require you to have at least one, but depending on the size of your vessel, you may need up to three or four. Uh, there's three types of fires that we're going to talk about today, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie, A, B, and C. Uh, class fire, that's uh, an ordinary combustible wood, paper, cloth, certain rubbers, plastic. But uh, class B, um, that could be uh, flammable liquids, gasoline, oil, grease, tar, oil-based paints, lacquers, flammable gases. We're going to use, uh, oh, sorry, in, in class Charlie, the electrical fires. So these tend to be very popular on boats that have more I don't know. Parking and sparking and water just don't mix sometimes. Um, a lot of people don't realize how big of a, an issue fires on a boat can be. Think, yeah, you're in the middle of the water. How bad could it be to have a fire? Um, you could just put water on it. Well, first of all, we've all um, heard the stories about having a grease fire in the kitchen. What is the one thing you don't do if you have a grease fire? Splash water on it. That's right. We make, make the fire worse, spread it to other areas. Water just doesn't doesn't cut it. Also, uh, if you're in a class C or Charlie fire, now this is electrical arcing and sparking. What happens if you're in a puddle? And you add more water to uh, an electrical spark. Uh, you could actually electrocute yourself just right through your feet. If you're standing in that puddle. Also, it's going to destroy your boat. Dry chemicals like this tend to smother the fire the best. So this is recommended. And we can go to the next slide now. Obviously, just uh, we're just gonna get this little tag here. That will just come off when you pull the pin. And then you just hang these and squeeze until the fire is extinguished. What was that? Cold water and boating. Uh, okay, we're, we're blessed with pretty good uh, temperatures and climates here in Charleston. Uh, we do uh, experience several days a year under 30 degrees, which can be uh, considered in the freezing point, where uh, it's important to dress properly. You know, you're not supposed to wear jeans when it's cold and you might be getting wet. You might not ever get those jeans dry again. And uh, hypothermia can set in pretty darn quick, especially when you're on the water where it's windy, it's unforgiving. I would recommend wearing neoprene, kind of like a spandexy material, as your first layer, and then another layer and another layer on top. And this little pockets of heat against your body doesn't allow it to escape as well. And also, uh, wool is a great insulator even when wet. Now, uh, if you're wearing one big jacket, like a down jacket or a Carhartt jacket, say you fall overboard, it's going to be pretty hard to swim in that thing. It's going to sink like a rock, um, and it's, it's really not going to insulate you once it's wet. Uh, if you do fall overboard, God forbid, uh, we did something in the Coast Guard to uh, practice. We would do survival swims, and we learned this thing called the help position, or heat escape lessening position. Um, so it's a survival move. Hopefully you have your life jacket on. If this does occur, you've fallen overboard. But how it's going to look is if, I don't know if you can see me when I squat down here. I'm going to just get down. If I'm in the water, I'm wearing a life jacket, and hopefully I am because I might have hit my head when I fell overboard. And uh, some life jackets are actually able to write so that your face is out of the water when uh, you're unconscious. But the best thing you can do is just conserve your energy. You're going to tuck your armpits because most of our heat is lost through their, our head, armpits, uh, I'm sorry, armpits, groin, and feet area. Well, we're just going to do the best we can to not move as much as we can. 
if we even see a boat, obviously you want to wave your arms. But if we're, if we're just going to be sitting for the long haul, waiting for some kind of rescue, tuck your arms, tuck your feet, tuck your knees, chin down, and just hope for the best. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, we're just gonna go over some basic distress signals. These are not all of them by any means, but uh, there are recognized distress signals that you should recognize in case it's something that you need to do or that you see out there on the water because if you spend enough time on the water, you're gonna hear distress signals uh, over the radio. You're gonna see people waving their arms. You're gonna hear about flares going off. Uh, some people uh, don't, just don't know. They might see a flare and think, oh, people are just, shooting that off for fun, but I'll tell you the truth, if you shoot off a flare near the water and it's not an emergency, you can get fined, pretty hefty fine, by the way, and even thrown in jail. Um, so here's, obviously the waving of the arms. If someone's waving, um, that's usually something you can uh, consider uh, a distress signal and tell you otherwise. Uh, waving an orange or red distress flag, uh, shooting off flares. Now, we're going to go over flares real quick because a lot of people do carry these. It's recommended on um, inland waterway travel, but it's not necessary. If you're going offshore, this is uh, required. We have our flare gun here. It's just like a shotgun, a shotgun shell, and it's got a uh, little pin inside, whereas it Cock it back. The firing pin will hit this um, cartridge. So I'm just going, even though I know it's a dummy round, I still have a thing about pulling the trigger. <laughs> but I put the uh, cartridge in the, um, the cylinder, I lock it back. I aim, pop. All right. Now always make sure that you see where the path of travel is going to be. Uh, you have to consider the wind factor. Don't shoot it straight up and down because it could come down on your boat if there's no wind or not enough. Shoot it slightly into the wind, slightly up, not straight out. You want to maximize the height and the burn time. So use your head. Um, another distress signal, SOS, the famous old do 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 Or if you had to tap it. Or use your clicker on your microphone on your VHF radio. Save our souls. Um, how do you hail the stress on a VHF radio? This is a good question. Um, first of all, it's not required to have a VHF radio. Highly recommended though. Um, if you need to call the stress, you're going to be on channel 16. The national, international hailing and distress frequency. You have to tell people where you are, what's wrong, description of your vessel, and um, you know. Hopefully, there are other people around that can that can come to your service. Hopefully, the Coast Guard is uh, available and has units en route. But um, we're going to hail it on channel six. Again, you always need to know where you are, what the problem is, description of your vessel. Followed by a whole bunch of other information that the Coast Guard is going to provide, like how many people on board, um, what kind of safety equipment do you have, and are there any kind of underlying conditions that people on board, like heart disease? Uh, older or younger people can't take care of themselves. Uh, let's talk about more dis distress signals. We've got, if you hear gunshots, this is not normal um, at one minute interval. Right? Certainly, there are places where people are allowed to shoot shotguns off of their John boats and go duck hunting, yada, yada. But if you hear a, um, a distinct interval of gunshots over and over and over, less than one minute intervals, this could be considered a distress. So call that into the Coast Guard, let them know what you uh, Also, black smoke, this is probably the most obvious one. I don't think anyone loves. does anything with black smoke, smoke on purpose. And uh, this could mean that you're having a, a, a Bravo fire with flammable liquids. You've got gasoline burning. You just call it in, try to get to someone's help without putting yourself in harm's way. Um, okay, nighttime, uh, obviously, 
Well, there's there's one more in the daytime that I didn't say. Uh, orange smoke or, or orange dye in the water. These things do not work at night, but they're much better in the daytime than a flare because smoke can be seen above the horizon from 20 miles away, whereas a flare, if it's bright out, you're not going to see it at all. Next slide. Okay, why should I get a VHF radio and not just you know, rely on my cell phone? Well, a lot of people have asked me that actually. This is, yeah, it's another piece of equipment to buy. There's, there's so much involved with boating. I've already spent so much on this boat, but fuel costs so much. But uh, you know, it's going out into the wilderness, going out to the food chain, away from cell phone towers sometimes. They don't always work on the water. Um, even up in, in the ICW in between Georgetown, Honda, the uh, cell phones work with um, antenna towers. Uh, they're not satellite. So, you know, if you're more than like 12 miles away from a tower, you really start to lose control, especially when you're going offshore. I've seen it um, fade off my phone probably around eight miles to 13 miles. It's just, it's iffy in between that spot. By, by the time you hit 13 miles, I don't care what service you have, you're not getting now, um, you can get a satellite telephone if you'd like, or VHF, which is way cheaper. Um, the better thing about VHF is that uh, you could actually uh, submerge some of them. They're waterproof. I think some of the phones are nowadays. But um, what we can do is uh, you can call multiple people at once on the radio, and you can uh, ensure uh, your chances of being rescued. Um, you can call the Coast Guard. They're monitoring 24-7. And you may not, you're not going to get a busy signal. One thing that you can also rely on is that your position can be tracked on a VHF. If you hit that transmit button, the Coast Guard has towers along the coast and they can triangulate you given your, uh, the strength of your. So they, uh, they come in either a handheld uh, or a uh, fixed mount VHF radio system. You can afford both. That, that's ideal, especially if you're going offshore. The uh, the fixed mount ones, um, they are probably better for long range communications because the taller your antenna is, the better signal strength you're going to have. Um, the Coast Guard should be able to hear you well over 100 miles, whether you have a um, fixed mount or not. But after you go out for 100 miles, you know these little handheld radios, they're not going to reach. Man. Um, so again, we're going to go over the channels here. Channel 16 is international handling distress. So if you have multiple radios, one of them should always be on. Uh, that's who you're going to call the Coast Guard with. And anyone else that you see on the water, your initial contact is going to be channel 16. So let's give an example of how to operate the radio, how to hail someone. Say uh, you're meeting up with a boat that you recognize. And uh, I'm the Lady Gale. This is um, the sea serpent. I, I tell them, hey, sea serpent, this is the Lady Gale off your bow, channel 16, over. And then they'll respond back. And then once you've got them back, tell them, let's switch to channel 12. And they'll say, channel 12, Roger, and you're off 16. You want to make that as quick and clear as possible. And then you can free up channel 16 for the rest. Um, if, if anyone else needed to use that frequency, they'd have to wait for your babble to be over. Only, um, you can only hear one conversation at a time on the one slight flaw of the system. If you're in the same area, only one person gets to be heard at the same time. Um, now with the Coast Guard, if you hail them on 16, they'll normally get some information. We'll be back. Um, it will normally give them some information. They'll switch you to channel 2-2 even if you are still in an emergency situation so that they can handle multiple emergencies. Uh, if you need to hail a bridge, there's a lot of bridges here in Charleston. Uh, they're on channel nine. Um, there's several other channels that we don't really have to go over. Some, some are for commercial use, some are for anyone else that wants to use them. Um, there's a weather button, WX, that's uh, for NOAA, or National Oceanographic and um, Atmospheric Administration. They do uh, the official government weather. They'll do a repeating um, 
message about impending weather, storms, tides, things of that nature. Uh, DSC, I don't know if anyone knows what that means, but uh, just, you know, in the last few years, they've been putting digital selective calling on VHF radios. This is a, a newer feature that allows uh, the Coast Guard to pick up some information if you press this button. Uh, you have to register your radio. Um, it's got a specific serial number in that radio. And um, if you register it with your information online, it'll, once you press this button, means you're in an emergency and you're in distress. This is your name. This is where you're from. This is a description of your vessel. And all of that can be done with just the press of a button instead of spending two minutes or more while you're in an emergency telling the Coast Guard this. Maybe with not even um, very clear communication, but there might be interference. It's uh, not always easy to describe what's happening when you're in duress out there in the water. Slash. Ooh, my favorite part. Common useful knots. I love working with line. I've been staying salty lately so that I can bring this to you guys virtually. But here's an example of a double braided nylon line, kind of a common type of line that boats would use to moor up to the dock and to other things. Um, why, why do I need to know the proper way to throw a line? Probably because you can't push a rope, right? You're not gonna get very far trying to toss a line that has knots in it or not times that you, uh, really where it's important is if you're coming up to a dock and you have an off the dock wind, it's blowing you away from where you're trying to go. And boats tend to not um, operate sideways very easily. Is that right? So if you can get your bow close enough to the dock and you have a line ready to throw, you can throw this to a dock attendant or even try to lasso yourself to a cleat. Now, this is something that takes practice. I'd rather do it in person, believe me but we're gonna to have to make do. So first we're gonna take a little bit of line here. I like to hold it up with my left hand and I just make coils. And I'll make a few coils. And I know that there's no knots in my line and it's not attached to anything and I'm not gonna hit anything when I throw it. So with my right hand, I'm gonna hold on to the, the bitter end and I'm gonna take about half of it with my other hand. I'm gonna back up a little bit. All right, and then I can just kind of swing it and throw. And I should be able to extend the entire rope or line in one quick, easy pass. But let's say you have, can we angle this down real quick? Like that. This is a typical boat um, that I run across all the time. There's our line here, and I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm coming up to the dock, and I need to throw. I pick it up and I try to, and I've got knots, and I try to throw it. I just, it doesn't work. So get it into your head to always be prepared before you come into a close quarters situation with a boat. Have your line ready to toss. Make nice, neat coils. Okay, so we listened to Captain Graham. We made it into the dock city. Proud of you. Okay. Um, I don't have a cleat here with me, but we can pretend that this anchor is a cleat. If my lovely assistant, Deanna, wouldn't mind uh, holding this for, me for a second. Hold it just like that. So cleats have basically two points. And you want to just make sure that you're going, you're doing crisscrosses from one part of the cleat to the other. Crisscross, you got two figure eights over the top. Now with your last one, it's, it might be hard to see, but you want to twist and do a locking cross. Let's do that one more time, maybe a little bit closer so that they can really see. Okay, I wonder if we get a better So, if you can picture this, as a cleat on a dock, we're just gonna we're gonna go around the back. We're gonna come through the middle, 
go over the top and we're going to make it a figure eight and we're going to do another figure eight okay at this point you're going to take your hand and you're going to make a loop and pull it through so that it is now locked and you can do it either way it depends on which way your boat is facing but as long as your your last line coming out is below the crossed over figure eight it's going to lock in place and the friction of that of that line is going to ensure that your boat doesn't drift away overnight all right um float hitch to a rail i'm going to use my my lovely assistant again. Thank you. Uh, so, why a clove hitch? Well, fenders like to hang vertically, and bars on a boat tend to be horizontal, right? So, uh, let's say we've got this fender here. I'm just gonna have my fender hanging down, all right? With my line here, how best to attach it to the, the uh, side rail of my boat? I like to use a clove hitch, get a little closer. So right here is a turn where the, the line just kind of comes around once like that, does a 180, that's a turn. This, is called a round turn. So 180, 360. That's a round turn. A clove hitch is going to have two round turns, but on your second round turn, it's coming up inside of that crossover. And it's going to look like a neat little X. If we can zoom in, it looks like this the white background there. Yeah, if you want that to stay even longer, sometimes I like to, if you're going to leave it overnight, just do another cross through. That would just be a double clove hitch. But you could put all the weight you want in the world, you could hang off that, and the friction of this line is going to ensure that that is going nowhere. And I know it's kind of hard to see on the computer, but feel free to rewind it, rewatch it. And if you have any questions or you want me to do any of these over again, please let me know. We have um, some time here if we do need to take questions. What do we have next? A round turn and two half inches. This is also in one I need a bar for. <laughs> this is an alternate. Um, or an alternative of the clove hitch. All right, I'm gonna try to keep this. Uh, by the way, if you're wondering if this is behind us, it's a Type 4 throwable. This is a Marine Max style, but they're all the same. Type 4 throwables are required on every boat. It is uh, a light vest cushion that you can throw and make pretty good distance. The Coast Guard will ask for that when they board you. All right, round turn. So we know what a turn is, that's just this. Round turn. And then two half hitches. So we're gonna come around the bottom. We're gonna come around the bottom again. There's one half hitch. Boy, this is hard to see, Deanna. I think we need to have a lighter background. But that's what it's supposed to look like. And if you tighten it up, it actually looks neater. But also a very salty knot. If you take any of this home today, try to remember a knot and impress your loved one with it. Yeah, we're gonna do a, a bowling. Now this one is uh, 
One of the hardest knots that you're gonna learn, and it takes a lot of practice. We don't need this pull anymore, thank you. Um, I'm gonna hold this uh, standing park with my left hand. I'm gonna take my right hand, and I'm gonna make a loop upward. I'm going to send the famous rabbit through the hole, around the back of the tree, back through the hole, once it came. Bowling. There it is. Square knot. Be the last knot we do. Hold on a second. So for joining two different lines of the same or equal size and type, we're just going to cross, make it like a like a shoe tying thing here, and then we're going to do it again over the top. I'm trying to keep it in front of that type four. So we're not here, and you can test it by going like this. Otherwise, if it doesn't do that, you've got yourself a granny knot, and they do not tend to hold very well. Line snowing, the last portion on lines. I, uh, I kind of get a little bit of OCD when I see lines just kind of scattered around the deck, thrown around. If you're going to have a nice vessel, you might as well make it look nice and drape your lines around it in the proper fashion. So we're just gonna make coils like I started out with earlier. And these coils will be smaller or larger depending on how long your line is, how manageable it is. I've got equal size coils with no, no uh, twists in them. I'm going to do a loop around the top, maybe another second loop. And then I'm putting a bite through the top of the loop. Then I'm putting the bitter end through that loop. I just had a question um, from Dar. When do you use the varying knots? Okay, uh, which knots are we talking? Dar, if you want to type in if there's a specific knot, Dar, if you want to type in if there's a specific knot that you're inquiring about, um, yeah. she said, when do you use the varying knots? Well, we, we talked about the cloak hitch first. That was uh, basically, it's the best one for hanging fenders off the side of your boat. And the, the round turn for the two half hitches, that also, that also works for hanging fenders. Um, we, we've got the cleat hitch. And uh, that obviously is basically meant for just cleat. The bowling. Um, bowling works if you need to put a temporary eye in a line. So uh, maybe you've come to your boat one day and we noticed that there used to be an eye splice at the end of this. Well, now it's, it's snapped. It's snapped overnight and you're on, your boat's hanging on by a thread, maybe just one line instead of two, or two instead of three lines. Well, how do you fix a, a, one of your lines that has snapped uh, eye splice is by making another eye splice with a bullet. That way you can use it on the dock again. So I'll make a bowling real quick and I'll show you that it does kind of replicate an eye splice where you can use it, put it through a cleat and not reattach your boat. A uh, word of warning, once you put a, a bowling in it and then it, it goes under a lot of strain and the boat surges on it over and over for hours, uh, good luck getting that bowling out. This has become part of your line. And you've also uh, taken strength away from the line that the, the Snapping um, strength has now decreased. Um, okay, what else do we have? Uh, we've got this slide and the next slide. These are just placards that need to be displayed on your boat saying that you're not allowed to discharge oil. The next one is going to be uh, oh. there we go. Getting on the slide. Hold on. Okay. 
Have we lost it? Okay. And so, yeah, uh, every bullet's gonna need to have this oil placard and another placard that tells you about uh, dumping garbage. Garbage uh, can be dumped actually, as long as you're a certain distance away from the port. It depends on what type of garbage it is. Mainly what I wanna to touch on is if your boat has a head or an installed waste tank, uh, this can hold your number ones and your number twos. If you're caught dumping that in the harbor, not only will I get really mad at you, uh, you can get fined up the wazoo. Uh, it's disgusting. But if you can go three miles offshore, then you can dump all the waste you want. Uh, if you have to get a pump out, they're available in all the major uh, marinas. Okay, first aid. Uh, I'm not going to go over too much on what needs to be in your first aid kit. I think uh, you know, if you're going to carry anything, carry gauze, latex gloves, so you can protect yourself if you have to help anyone else. Uh, cotton and uh, maybe some Tylenol, Meclizine. Meclizine, or uh, well, I forgot the other one. But meclizine is a good one for seasickness. You have to take that 20 minutes before you get on your way for it to be effective. Um, it's going to be offshore and it's going to be rough. Meclizine, I would recommend. Uh, now, on their first aid, uh, just, you know, if you buy a, a kit at West Marine, they, they come uh, with everything they need for, for basic preparation. Uh, there's a few. Navigation rules of the road that I like to go over. Uh, there are about a million, but we don't have time for that. And uh, you know, I think as a prudent voter, you should know based like if two boats are meeting, let's go like this. If say they're coming upriver and one's going downriver, and you have no way of contacting them, they don't have a radio, you can't tell what they're going to do. If everyone made a right turn. No one would ever get in an accident. So that's the default move. If you're in a meeting situation, just turn right and go around. And if um, if if you can, you have a, a sound producing device, which is also required on a boat. Uh, one short blast, that means you're going to, to alter your course to starboard. Now, uh, hopefully, the person that you're meeting will also uh, return that that one short blast. If you make two short blasts, that means you're coming to port. Boop, boop, port. One blast, boop, starboard. There's that. Now, this is uh, what you're calling an overtaking situation. If you're coming up from, from the stern of another boat and you want to go around them because you're in a confined area, like, say, the ICW. The intracoastal waterway. Some places can get really thin, um, maybe only 20 yards wide. So if you're going to be overtaking someone, it's best to make a sound signal first. Again, one short blast to go around on the, the starboard. If you make a right and you pass your port to their starboard, that's one short blast. If you're going to go around them, to if you're going to the left of them, you're going to sound short blast. So if you alter your course to starboard, one short blast. If you alter to port, go around them that way, two short blasts. Um, if they happen to alter course while you're trying to pass them, it's still your fault if there's a collision, right? They are the right of way vessel, you are the give way. Because they, they may not see you or hear you coming up from behind. Um, here's another Type of situation is called the crossing situation. Um, this is a really good one to know because there's a big reason why there's uh, red and green lights on boats. Uh, here's what you're going to do you're going to look at a, a situation at night where two boats are converging uh, on a collision course. Okay, one boat you're going to see um, a red light, the other boat's going to see a green light. Well, whoever sees the red light. That's the person who's going to stop and give way. Let the other get right of way. Uh, if they see your green, they're going to be like, okay, I have the green light. I get the right of way. So 
if, if this doesn't make sense, please let me know. But um, the port side has the red light. And if that other person sees your port side, you have the right of way. But don't assume they know that. This is the proper way that uh, the rules of the road work. Now, what happens when there's no, uh, well, when it's daylight and you don't have your lights on, you can't see. Well, just know left is your red side. So if they see your port side, you have right of way. If an accident happens, they're going to be at fault. But, you know, it's still your job to assume they don't know. Is there an easy way to remember that, Captain Graham, that usually people use like port and left? Um, port and left for me, probably. Like port has four letters in it, so it's to your left. Or like right. four twine, I think I've heard before as well. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people like the whole the four letter thing. Yeah, that, that makes it easier for you. That's not what I remember. I yeah. was just wondering if you had, you know, what something that you used. Tricks of the trade, so, you know. <laughs> P O R T L E F T. That's an easy one. I couldn't imagine that easier. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of types of buoys out there and signals that you'll see uh, visually. Let's just remember one if you're going to remember anything today. Red, right, return. If you're coming from the ocean and you're heading back inland or into the Charleston Harbor, you're going to have the red buoys on your right. Red, right, return. All right. Uh, if you see a buoy that's uh, red and green, you can go left or right of it. Sometimes you'll see it red, green, red. Or green, red, green. If you see like both colors on that, you can still go on either side, but one channel side is going to be preferred. Whatever the color is more prominent. So if it's got red, green, red, they prefer you to go right. It's more water over there, but you can still go left. Be careful. Well, Captain Graham, somebody asked, does this hold true in the ICWs as well in the intercoastal waterway? No. Because you're not entering from a larger body of water. So what you're doing is you're traveling the ditch. You're going from New York to Florida. Uh, the, the whole way down is going to hold true that the red is on your right when you're heading south. Red, right, south. If you just say that to yourself a few times, it really should stick. Just like red, right, return. Maybe uh, you're a snowbird, you're returning south. Red, right, south in the ICW. And uh, a lot of times you're going to be crossing over ocean inlets, a uh, breach inlet, Dewey's inlet, um, Capers inlet. Every time you pass an inlet like that, you're going to see uh, markers. Like all of a sudden, you see a green marker uh, on your on your red on your right side if you're heading south. Well, you've just passed uh, passed a converging uh, river. Now, the only reason that you know one from the other is all of the um, Day boards and buoys in the ICW are going to have a little yellow rectangle at the bottom. And it's only going to be about this big. ICW buoys, little yellow rectangle. Um, if you see anything like these, these are danger buoys and other um, hazard buoys, mooring buoys, you steer clear of those. Uh, running aground, this happens a lot. I've seen it a million times, especially being a towboat U.S. captain. Uh, this was kind of my hobby. I spent many uh, midnights on Sundays uh, getting people off of mud banks where they don't belong. Um, you know, we, we call it a Reds run. A lot of times people will just haul butt going out of Shen Creek and they'll hit Crab Bank. Um, instead of making the right or the left outside of the channel, which is a 90 degree turn. Um, usually the boat turns out to be okay. Uh, sand. sand is okay. It might scuff up the delta coat a little bit. Um, what you can do is first gather your composure. Hopefully it wasn't too bad. No one got thrown off the boat. Make sure everyone's there. Make sure everyone's okay. Look into your bilges. Look around your boat. Right, you, you don't see any cracks. Nothing's, nothing's obviously broken. If you feel like continuing on with your voyage, you can try to back yourself off directly back. But make sure you tilt your engine back up um, so that it's just under the water line. You don't want, you want to be sucking up any silt or sand into your impellers. That can be damaging for the boat, and then you're really going nowhere. Um, once you are starting to float again, 
Um, again, back straight off. Don't try to push through. If you're in a mud bank, you can't tell how far, how deep it is in front of you. It might just be a half a foot deep for another football field. But um, just back straight off of what you did. Yes, ma'am. How do we know about, you know, how to avoid them or what happens if we run around into an oyster bed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of answers to that. And I'll tell you one thing. There's, <laughs> there's only two types of captains. And don't feel bad if you have run aground because the two types of captains are ones that have run aground and ones that will. All right? No pressure. <laughs> Um, the best way to kind of get your feel for a new area, if you might be new to Charleston, I would recommend getting on a boat, cruising around at moderate to slow speed at low tide. All right, we can look at a tide table and go out there and time it so that we can see more contours, um, more features, more land is exposed at low tide. So you can learn a heck of a lot more um, versus a high tide is actually more dangerous because people have that false sense of like there's more water around and more places to go play when, when the Charleston has a lot of um, mud, mud flats that are really just underneath the surface at high tide for vast expanses. Um, oyster beds, yeah, they can they can put some nasty mix in your in your hull, but um, I wouldn't be too worried about them other than you, you could find oyster shoals on uh, charts if you have a printed navigation chart or uh, navionics on your phone or um, if you have a skim rat or a Garmin machine on your boat, they usually mark the, the shoals on those. Uh, we, obviously, they're not all marked with poles or signs, so you can't just think like, oh, I ran aground, someone really needs to mark this. You can't white pad, uh, you know, put white padding around the whole earth. There's, there's too many places to get in trouble. So really, if you're out there, you're on your own, it's your fault, and you can be responsible for knowing your area. If you hit it going two knots, no big deal. If you hit it going 20, well, you might be in a serious situation. Uh, we can sometimes you, know, you can be towed off. Other times you might have to wait another eight hours for the tide to lower back down and then rise up again. Another question from Kelly, and yes, Kelly. she would like to know how old do you have to be to get your boating license? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I I believe that you have to be 12 to actually um, operate a boat by yourself. If this changes from state to state, Coast Guard does not actually have any bearing on that decision. Um, you know, if you see a six-year-old operating a boat alone, well, yeah, they're probably going to have a problem with that. But um, there's no federal law that says uh, voting age. Now, one thing that we can do here is uh, search the DNR website. And uh, South Carolina probably does have a minimum age. And I believe it might, it might be 16 here. Okay, 16 in Charleston. Um, it's, see, I grew up in Long Island, New York, and we were able to get a, um, a test taken when we were, I think, 12. And you can operate a boat alone at 12, but only a certain size during the day. And, you know, there were many rules involved. But Charleston or South Carolina has, has its own rule, 16 years. And does that require a license at that age, or you could just start voting when you get that right? The age of 16 must complete a voting course approved, approved by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources in order to operate a motorboat. And once you hit 16, you don't need a license. So if you're under 16 and your parents think that you're mature enough to operate, then you go ahead and go take that test. You can operate a jet ski or a small boat. I wouldn't give them the keys to the 80 footer, not just yet, but uh, that's 16 years. Uh, tides. Charleston is a, is a tide dominated area. We have some uh, um, very, uh, very sharp rises and falls here and there, depending on the, the lunar cycle. But uh, it, this is a semi diurnal tidal zone. That means we have two highs and two lows every day, 24 hour period. And you can time it like a clock for the next 20 years. Um, it's, all, uh, it's all very predictable depending on the, the moon phase. But uh, I've seen um, high tides as high as 10 feet above uh, average down in Church Creek. And that's not even a storm. That's just a spring tide. 
spring tide is when you have about a full moon every month, or they call it a king tide too. Uh, every month you're gonna have a high of, of more than normal height. And then every uh, opposite of that month, you're gonna have a neap tide. Spring tide and a neap tide. This is when you have uh, low, low highs, if that makes any sense. Every day you're going to have two highs. One high is going to be higher than the other high. And one low is going to be lower than the other low. So you have the high high, the low high, the high low, and the low high. <laughs> now, if anyone gets confused, please let me know. Um, there, there are a lot of good tide apps to look for. Um, on your cell phone, I like to use one called Tide Track, T I D T R A C. Um, it allows you to find out the tide on any day. But next week, you want to go boating, maybe you want to take a kayak out um, and you've got a private dock or a private ramp in your neighborhood. Uh, a lot of those are tide restricted. You can't go out below tide, you have to wait for mid tide or higher. If it's mid tide and falling, so you don't have much time before you have to get back to the ramp, otherwise, you're Getting, you're going trotting through knee deep or waist deep fluff mud to get home. That's no fun. Believe me, that's also where uh, the oyster shells like to hang out. They, they they hide in the mud. They can really catch your feet up. But um, lunar effects, yep. Yeah. So, you know, again, you're going to notice around two days before a high uh, full moon and two days after those those high tides are going to be drastic. Um, tide timing. Uh, this is kind of a complicated issue, but just picture this. It's very true. The high tide in Charleston is, uh, to me, when I hear it on the news, the high tide is at 12 o'clock, 12.01 p.m. Well, to me, it doesn't make sense because I know if I go um, into, say, Church Creek off of the Stono River, 15 miles inland, uh, that high tide is going to be two hours behind Charleston Harbor. So if the high tide is at 12, at Fort Moultrie, Charleston Harbor. Uh, we're not gonna get a high tide in the Stono River until at least two p.m. So this has to do with your uh, proximity to the nearest uh, ocean inlet. And uh, also it, it depends on your north to south. So a high tide at Myrtle Beach is going to be completely different than a high tide in Charleston. So it's always good to use the, the, uh, the cell phone app or a no website. You got to type in your geographical location to get an accurate high tide. How does one know their geographical location? Well, uh, you can type in an area code or a zip code or uh, an old website. They'll give you like the approximate area of tide. But of course, you could be in the same zip code and uh, two two different bodies of water: Ashley River, Stono River. You know, uh, West Ashley is divided by by two different bodies. And they're going to have different tides. So um, there, there are things called tidal stations, and uh, all of these apps you use, you're going to actually want to click the closest tidal station to you. If it's on a map, here you are. You can see where you are. You can see the closest tidal station to you. That's going to be the most accurate number. Uh, just know that you know the longer the river is, without if say if you go up the Cooper River, it goes up 30 miles before it hits the dam. That's going to affect the tide as well. So is that is the tide is either flooding coming in or the tide is ebbing going out? You're going to see a lot more ebb time on a river like the Cooper because it's got nowhere else to go. It's got to come all the way back out to the ocean. If any more questions come up, I'd love to answer them. Via email. Absolutely. Um, we did get one more question from Dar, but ladies, now is your time to ask any questions you may have. Any questions that you can think of that maybe you know you've been on a boat and you thought it was a silly or an obvious question. Um, that's what Captive Graham is here for today. So um, as we are wrapping up, I did have one more question. Um, we travel all over the country. Does your residence state registration and licenses apply to other states? Um, and yes, actually I can answer that question. They do. Um, so just so you know, you're able to use your license and registrations in other states. Um, I also had another question from Amber Murray. Um, at minimum, we would like a boat with a restroom. I think the correct term is ahead. Yes, Amber, you're correct. It's ahead. Um, what is the starting price point for a boat with that feature? 
Um, out of the boat lines that we carry and our main boat lines that we carry, Amber, our um, Scow, Sea Ray, Boston Whaler, and then we go into our yachts. Um, but the starting price point for a boat with a head in it would be right around 65,000. Um, that can vary depending on the features that you get, obviously, and boat show season too, which um, can also vary in pricing. Uh, highly recommend you checking out our inventory where it's always constantly changing and we're able to pull inventory from any of our 60 plus locations. So if you've been um, thrift shopping for one, I definitely recommend uh, going online and checking out to see all the different features and uh, models that we have. Um, so Kelly asked where we're located. Great question, Kelly. Thank you for asking. We are located on Daniel Island, right off of uh, Clements Ferry of 526. Um, we're the big yellow building um, off of 526. You can't miss us. Um, we are here Monday through Saturday. Um, if we don't have any other questions, um, I will post um, the next virtual women on water class that we're going to be doing. Um, on our website, marinemax.com, the events page, or you can go to our Facebook page. Um, and I just had a question from somebody asking, um, we are recording the class, so uh, if we don't have any more questions, at the end of this, I will make sure to send you ladies um, the recording along with um, the PowerPoint so you can use to reference. Um, and then please feel free if like any questions come up later, don't hesitate to email them to me. Um, I'm definitely gonna be looking for all of the feedback that you guys have from this. Again, this is our first time, so thank you so much um, for bearing with it through us. Um, we will schedule more classes that I'll put on uh, online. And once we are able to um, do our regular classes, which uh, consists of about an hour classroom style, kind of what you guys saw here today, and then um, a couple hours actually out on one of our boats, um, where you get to learn how to drive, um, you get to learn to tie knots hands-on, you get to learn how to dock the boat, and you have Captain Graham there um, walking you through every step of the way. Um, so I don't need you to it either. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, again, with the circumstances, we're happy to still being able to bring this class to you guys virtually. Um, so keep a lookout for when we'll schedule the next one so that you can let all of your friends and family know to, to join in. And um, thank you all again so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call or reach out to us. Thank you.